and welcome to the Good Grief Festival. I'm Liesl Dawson, Associate Professor at the University of Bristol. And in today's panel, we'll be focusing on the making of two audio pieces that focus on death, gr grief, and the end of life. And also why and how telling stories might be beneficial to us when we are grieving. The two audio pieces are The Colors and The Colors of Loss. They are both available to listen to during the festival, and then later on, they'll be available on the Good Grief channel. I'm joined today by writer, producer, and performer, Harriet Maidley, and also producer, writer, and performer, Mark Knightley. Harriet and Mark both run Crowded Room, a theater company specializing in true stories about challenging subjects. They work closely with people with lived experience, sometimes building scripts from their words and sometimes co-creating the work itself. I'm also joined by Amanda Saderhelm. She's a certified play therapist, an expert in the field of innovative, innovative creative play therapy for children. She's also the author of several books, including the children's book, Isaac and the Red Jumper, the book for professionals, helping children become the hero of their stories, a practical guide to overcoming adversity and building resilience in every setting. And she's also the author of the memoir, Coming to My Senses, Finding My Voice Through Ovarian Cancer. Amanda is also the founder of Helping Children Smile Again. So thank you everybody um, for joining us today on the Good Grief Festival. Can I start with you, Harriet? Can you tell us a little bit about these two audio pieces and your interest in grief? Sure. So um, the colors was the first the first project that that we made, and that started. I started researching that in back in twenty eighteen, and I think that was that was more born out of a desire to sort of talk about death, honestly, um, and grief, obviously. <laughs> falls under the banner of death but I think um yeah I was always just really struck by how bad people are at talking about death um and I had like for a long time experienced a kind of anxiety around death that I felt like I wanted to sort of share but it was all quite abstract I didn't really have that much personal experience of death or grief and actually funnily enough since working on both of these projects um Mark and I have had much more experience of of that um illness and also also grief but um I basically I decided I wanted to go and interview people with life-limiting illnesses to talk to them honestly about what they were experiencing um and to see if I could kind of <laughs> it sounds so naive in retrospect but to see if I could sort of get a conversation going about mortality um and I visited this uh palliative care unit in Swansea um and one in Cardiff as well and just had conversations basically with, with patients, doctors and nurses around the theme of mortality, but also just about their lives, talking to them about their lives. And um, interestingly, like people didn't really want to directly engage with, with the idea of death, um, even then, you know. And so really what we sort of ended up with was a verbatim piece, The Colours, which um, just gets, uh, helps us get to know the people who are living through this um and it's almost as if the what they're experiencing is kind of the, the context underneath that but it's not actually they're still not speaking about it in in such direct terms um yeah so that that's a verbatim play that's entirely made up of, of interviews can you tell can you just tell uh our audience for those who don't know what a verbatim piece is because really. some people might not know yeah sure so so the original theater piece um, was made up entirely of audio recorded interviews um, that were then performed by actors. So if it's verbatim, it's using entirely uh, real words or real transcripts um, or real recordings in the case of the colors. Um, but what we're sort of premiering today is, is an audio adaptation of that, which threads through the story of what I experienced whilst making that play, which coincidentally um, ended up having quite a lot to do with with uh, illness and death <laughs> um yeah so 
I mean, I don't know if I should go into that now. You don't, would you? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'd be interested to hear, Harriet. Like, what can yeah. you share with us what your personal experiences were? And I guess if that had an impact on how you saw this project or what, what you found from the people you interviewed. Yeah. Um, so I, whilst doing the interviews with people with life-limiting illnesses, I was diagnosed with a potentially life-limiting illness myself, which was just almost kind of too neat to be true. Right. <laughs> but um yeah, and that happened quite early on. And my initial reaction was to not want to do the project anymore, to be honest. Um, yeah, I sort of felt like I, I had thought it would be great to talk about all of this stuff. And then as soon as it was happening to me, I thought, God, I can't imagine anything worse. I just want to escape. Um, that didn't go on for that long, though. I then did go back and I did speak to them. And it gave me a much, I suppose, deeper connection to what we were talking about also helped me not feel like an imposter, which I think is is an interesting dynamic that can kind of occur when you're making this work sometimes. Um, and I got I got a lot from the people that I spoke to. They're kind of, they're, it sounds a bit kind of glib, but they're, they're resilience basically. And, and uh, I, I drew a lot from, from their experiences. Um, I mean, my illness isn't, I'm not, uh, it's a very kind of invisible and unknown thing in terms of how and when it will make me ill. And obviously I'm not comparing it to what these people were going through, but yeah, that's so my personal experience ended up factoring in very, very closely. Um, I've listened to the new, the new, well, uh, you know, the, 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 the audio piece and I found the way that the stories that you hear from people who are in this hospice framed by your own encounter with a life limiting diagnosis and the fearfulness of that for me that was one of the most powerful things of the audio piece and actually you thinking through mm. what it is to interview people what it is to have this and and maybe also I really found powerful your own initial preconceptions of what people who have a diagnosis would be like versus your own experience and yeah. I think for me it's that dialogue between an old self and a kind of newly awakened self mm. that is very moving and powerful and yeah and 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 it also provides an interesting frame yeah for what this art is doing yeah yeah absolutely I mean Oh, yeah, I was surprised by how um, you sort of expect that when somebody undergoes a, a, a diagnosis or whatever, that they'll completely change and what they want to talk about will become completely different. Right. But I suppose what was interesting is that and this almost sounds kind of obvious in retrospect, actually, that people were the same people that they were before. People had the same like desires, goals. Yeah. Personalities, yeah. relationships. But it, it did place a lot of stress on those relationships. And, and that was. That was certainly an interesting thing to explore. I mean, I think that it's it's always it's good to tell storytelling. Sorry, storytelling fits with this area because when you receive a diagnosis or when somebody you you love dies, your your whole world inverts, right? And um, you're suddenly thrust into this kind of new world, but you're essentially the same person, and you have to adjust to that. And so it's kind of classic storytelling structure stuff right yeah. um well and your whole idea of your life and who you are and your future is completely shattered yeah. and you have to construct a new narrative a narrative you don't wish to construct yeah in the light of this diagnosis which is very different I wonder if I could turn to Mark for a bit we've talked about the colors so that this is the the first it was a theater piece now it's an audio piece and visiting people who had a life-limiting illness. The Colors of Loss is a different piece, It's but it has similar methodologies. It's focused more specifically on grief. Uh, and, and, and I was very lucky to be part of the creative team in making this. Mark, do you want to say a little bit about what that project is, was, and, and the, the piece that came from it? Uh, yeah, sure. So we, um, it was sort of, we were thinking about the themes of the colours and how we could uh, explore them in a in a different way. And I guess the, 
the two types of work that we do with Crowded Room are verbatim and co-created. And the co-created kind of strand of our work is when we work uh, specifically with uh, individuals, real people, <laughs> well, we're all real people, but um, members of the public and, uh, and, and create a, a story with them. And uh, so sometimes we work with specific groups, like we've worked with groups of cleaners from Latin America. Um, and in this occasion, we just sort of advertise for people from the from the general public who had experience of grief and uh, yeah, and sort to uh, sit in a room with them and tell a story which we framed uh, as being a, a fictional story of a beloved tree that that dies and uh and the idea was that through that metaphor that we'd create a, a world together and through that metaphor uh we'd be able to explore uh our own sort of personal feelings and experiences of of grief lovely i mean one thing we were very interested in was this idea that perhaps telling a story that's related to grief but not telling your personal story might be in some way helpful or useful as an activity. I wonder if I could bring in Amanda here. Amanda also was part of the creative team um, for The Colors of Loss. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about why it is telling stories, this kind of imaginative play and the use of metaphor might be helpful to us if we are grieving. Mm, yes, thank you. I think Metaphor is particularly helpful when dealing with, with grief because it gives participants in any workshop like The Colours of Loss a um, protective factor. It sets up this concept of safety. So if you are, grief can be very confrontational and very scary. And it, as you said, it shatters all the beliefs that we have about ourselves and our story that we hold. So the metaphor is a safe space. It's a safe concept in which to explore through, through the character, in this case, the tree, um, your own experience of, of loss and of grief. I think the other thing it does is it liberates us from the, the facts, the real painful facts of our story and our, and our experience. And it allows us to explore some of the unconscious aspects of our grieving process that we've necessarily um, walled off or denied. And I think in this case, denial functions as a protective factor. It allows us to come to terms eat slowly with the pain of our, of our losses. So metaphor is, um, is a way in. I think in, in therapy, in, in the therapeutic um, world, we, we, I talk about finding a doorway into a, uh, a person's experience. And I think metaphor is, a, is one way of doing that. That's lovely. We, we had two researchers, Rachel Hare and Gina Walter, who also were part of the project. And their role was to conduct focus groups after the the audio recordings and speak to participants about their experiences. And, and, and this will come out in a, a kind of publication where they'll, their names will be anonymized. But I was really struck by a couple of people, one person in particular saying that they had never really spoken about their grief. And in fact, it was only this idea that it wouldn't be their grief, but a story about grief that gave them this ability to, to feel safe. And, and I, I found that very powerful. And also a, a, another participant talked about how they occupied their, their death had been very sudden. And with the, the, the death of the tree, they were able to think through a different kind of death, a slower death, and almost something that they'd been quite jealous about with the person who had died and almost to experience that other kind of grief and see both the benefits, but also what was tough about that. So it seemed to be, yeah. And, and, and the final, one of the final things I was, I was really struck by 
was the idea that by telling stories and, and bringing the loved one into this fictional world, they felt they were creating a new memory, a new experience that involved the person who died. So these are, these are some of the comments generated by the focus groups, which I found really, really powerful. And I wonder, Amanda first, and then maybe Harriet Mark, if you want to pick up on any of those. I've said quite a lot, any of those points. Amanda, do you want to, to pick up on any of that? Yeah, I think one of the um, participants in the in the focus group feedback that I, I, found, I was very moved by was, I think, um, was a lady, and she was talking about how, as a result of taking part in this workshop, she decided to actually plant a tree in their memory and I think what struck me about that was how the power of, st of story and how it allows us to reconstruct a sense of reality after the person has died and we're dealing on a you know sometimes a moment by moment basis with that loss and with that absence and we it's very difficult to find that kind of connection outside of storytelling and it's it's what I call the sort of restoring of our lives you know and I, I think she'd obviously found great comfort in being able to to tell her story and found something else that would allow her to reconnect and continue to reconnect with the person who died. Mm. Harriet or Mark do you, either of you want to come in on any of that? Yeah it's just I, I've found them the, the sort of most moving part of it uh, about when people were talking what might happen to the to the tree or to the space um after it had gone and there was yeah i mean both groups seemed to reach a consensus very quickly about what they'd like to happen um but both groups wanted some continuing relationship with the tree in like a, in a different way so whether it was uh, uh i think the gospel group wanted it as a as a stump that uh, then gets transformed into a uh in, into a chair that gets whittled away into into a carving um and uh yeah and the bristol group were talking about different ways it might manifest around around the village um and i just found that very powerful like how um i suppose after somebody dies you can still continue the relationship in a in a different way yeah, um, I'm just thinking about kind of storytelling across the two projects and, and that different aspects of, of what might, what in my experience, I feel it helps helps people and it helps me as well. I think there's, there's the process of telling the story and the sort of meaning making that can occur through that. Um, but then I think also when making this work, there is hopefully something about the fact that the story has been told and is then there and the kind of visibility that can go along with that which doesn't then have to be attached to people's names and like you said actually people often prefer not to sort of be named and you know uh, or identified um but even when you have actors representing you know it's no longer really you it's like you've told that story and that story is then out there in the world and other people are kind of receiving it and hearing about about you or, or your loved one and, and so that's also another way of making them kind of touch people and live on and um yeah, absolutely. I, I also for me, because I participated in one of the workshops, I found the collaborative element mm. so powerful. And I think often when we think about meaning making and stories, we'll think about them, you know, maybe in a therapeutic context or on our own. And there was something about being a, in a group, all of us together and opening up and creating the story together in a kind of communal way. And sometimes, you know, arguing or having disagreements or what about this, what about that? But I felt that th there was also something about the grief being witnessed by other people and heard and, and the kind of loving connection. When I, when I went home that day, I felt like, I can't believe I'm not gonna see these people again. We've just created a whole world and village, you know, but there's something about the, the collaborative aspect. And I and I wonder if that, Amanda, is, is that something that gets researched in terms of play therapy and storytelling? I think what tends to happen in a group is that there's a sense of permission that people feel goes round, let's say, the group itself. Um, and it starts, I think, with one person saying, stepping into that space 
and sharing something, which then gives the other people, the other participants, the permission to do that. That's quite a well a well established um, outcome for for doing when you do group group therapy work or therapeutic work. I, I just want to pick up on something that I really noticed was very powerful, and it it relates to this idea of of, of collaboration and also the parallel aspect of the process. Um, I think the the lady I mentioned who was going to plant a tree said that she felt very angry about the tree dying. And I noticed how people were actually able to express very directly their feelings of loss in relation to the tree. Someone said, even now I don't feel like the tree is really dead. And if we leave the tree there, it must come back. And I was struck by how that may, those comments may have been a reflection on their own grieving process as well as being about the tree. So I think it's it's a very powerful way to explore. To explore Absolutely. Grief. And actually one person said in the in the focus group that they were able, it, it was it, precisely that anger and that sense of the unfairness of the death. And actually when their loved person had died, people would push back against their complaints at the unfairness and yeah. somehow this was a space that those feelings could be voiced. Yeah. I think you can almost be more honest, can't you, when it's not, when you're not speaking directly about that person where you might have to sort of be more careful. You know, people were, were quite stark things said, like I felt embarrassed for it. I felt, it felt like people were really free in being able to, to speak. Um, that's very powerful. That happens more as the conversation progressed as well, actually, like towards it, it seems like, and that was one of the last tasks uh, that we did uh, when uh, I think we gave them uh, words like um, anger or guilt um, to to explore uh, in relation to the tree. And that seemed to, uh, yeah, really help to, to to channel a lot of that. We often think of literature as escapist, you know, and storytelling as, as escapist. But I wonder if it, it, it it's both an escape and a way of inhabiting our own narratives, but with this protective aspect. I yeah, wonder, I think, Harriet, yeah. I wondered if I could ask you, sorry, did you want to come in on that? I just it just I just had a thought, which is that, um, you know, people say that you, you cannot creativity cannot go along with self-consciousness. <laughs> so I think that through giving people a creative exercise and putting their uh, sort of self-consciousness, their awareness of themselves to one side, um, that enables people to access these very personal things um, more freely. Whereas if they were just asked to sort of sit down and talk about themselves, that is quite confronting. And um, although yeah. it is scary as well, like I felt self-conscious I didn't like, you know, as this sort of performer and various people talked about, you're nervous about being good enough and saying something yeah. smart enough and creative enough. So there is that worry. Um, but yes, I know what you mean. I wanted to ask you, Harriet, you, you mentioned that you also had, and Mark as well, had had bereavements and had your own experiences of grief since starting this project. And I wonder if, if, if you want to share any of those experiences and, and whether they changed or reframed how you thought about this work yeah um well mark do you want to let's talk about yours first because i think it probably don't relate to uh, yeah sure uh yeah i had a a really good friend uh who died uh i think um not long after we started working on on the colors and uh yeah and and so i uh, she died of of cancer um and it was quite it was quite you know it was it was long and she had and she had cancer from from when i knew her and uh so it was always like likely to happen at some point and she was um you know very ill for a long time but um yeah it was it was strange like the i suppose the group of friends that that knew her it was i i never sure if we like found a way to like process the, the the grief um together or like worked out like a narrative of you know like a kind of um like just how to do it as a group and uh, so it was really interesting and like 
yeah very profound for me like exploring it through um the workshops obviously I was like facilitating but also um contributing and um yeah it was really nice. I, I found like talking through metaphor very freeing and it was very nice to be able to to, to revisit actually that grief and that relationship it was nice to revisit the relationship in a fictional way and to almost be able to like re-spin a, a, a narrative and to be able to like say it out loud um in a way that you know I couldn't really say to to other people but yeah having permission to do that felt um felt 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 good and it felt like an, a thing that uh that Claire actually would have liked as well um because we used to do a lot of storytelling together um so it felt like yeah she would have uh, approved and, and enjoyed it mm. that's beautiful yeah what about what about you Harry I, I did find your you know it's funny in in the the colors of loss there is the moment where I say to you you know are you gonna write Mark are you gonna say something and um yeah and I, I found your story and hearing about her incredibly moving and she seemed part of that world and you know the community we created um yeah um when I was reading through the, the the focus group stuff I remember a woman one woman in the group said that she actually she had a bereavement that was quite recent and too too recent really and too big for her to sort of bring <clears throat> into the group which I thought was really interesting but she had found the group helpful anyway and um my sort of best friend died just just before we started this process with the colors of loss and for me it was a little bit like that like it was so big that I almost couldn't consciously sort of access it while we were doing so I knew that this is part of the reason I wanted to do this um but yeah I think as you said Amanda you're 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 or was it Liesl you're you're protect you're literally in a state of self-protection for so long I think it took me maybe 18 months to move out of a state of total shock because also she died in a very dramatic way um so but it was only really when actually listening to the piece that I felt connected to that and connected to her and very connected to all of these people um and I found it very very moving and very what's the word like it kind of gave me strength I suppose and helped me feel kind of a connection that um that was very very beneficial and I think helped move me forward a little bit yeah yeah and I think and I think on the colors you do you reflect in terms of your own experience how you know so it's not just about confronting but also we have to sometimes protect ourselves and and you know the dual model of grief which everyone talks about is about moving in and out it's about allowing yourself to feel things but also having periods of rest and protection yeah. and it does strike me <laughs> that creative projects allow for that space where you can kind of move in and out and you can lean in to the story and mark you say this in the workshop you can lean into the fiction you can lean into your own experiences mm -hmm. but it's quite flexible as an approach amanda what about you mm -hmm. have you found you're, you're a therapist but you've also used creativity in your own life and i wonder what your reflections are yes i mean i i think all aspects of of storytelling um are, i see them as containers in in my personal uh, case um I had a, a diagnosis of, of cancer ovarian cancer almost well 20 years ago now and my way in my doorway into exploring all of the mess and all of the the chaos of that loss was through painting which then became my entry point into play and creativity and eventually play therapy so I think whatever and the paint itself provided um, a framework, a frame, a safe space in which to explore all the different aspects of that illness and recovery. So I think whatever choice you make, whether it's painting or, or more conventional storytelling uh, or puppetry, in my case, I have access to a, a lot of different creative mediums. The starting point is always the same. It's to, it's to ask, you know, um, 
what is what is the issue that you want to explore um, which is why I found the choice of a tree so powerful because I think it's elemental it puts us in touch with all the the elemental soulful elements of what it means to be alive what it means to die the seasons of life and death so I, I think whatever medium you're using what you are doing is interacting with those parts of yourself that have been bereaved that have been lost and it's about rediscovering them again which the mediums allow us to do in a way that talking verbally as we are now might be more difficult you know we might come up against fear anxiety worry and we push them away but when you're drawing or painting or telling a story um, through a character you all that gets pushed to one side and you have direct access um, to the the, the, the the creative spirit which allows you the freedom to tell the story so it's, it's a very powerful that's lovely and and the colors too is not just itself an imaginative engagement with diagnosis end of life it also contains within it these meditations that I guess the people at the, in the hospice did about going to different places and so can you say a little bit about that Harriet yeah um I think actually this was the original point of connection between the two pieces this is what got us thinking about uh doing a creative project with people um while I was in the hospice I sat in these meditations where people would basically they would dim the lights and people would get uh taken to a, a beach or a rainforest or a world full of colors and there was something about it I couldn't quite figure out what it was at first but it I, I suddenly felt so moved and so um I felt so overwhelmed by how creative people are and how much people, how how viscerally people can live in their imaginations that they really feel they are there and they can then place themselves in this place and that actually helps them access uh, things that, again, may have been more difficult for them to access just in a conversation with the lights on looking at each other. Um, so the, the joy that occupational therapists took them uh, sent them to the beach or whatever and then sort of had conversations with them while they were in that space and I think you know in a slightly similar way to the colors of loss like either they would go to a place from their childhoods or they would um just imagine somewhere that they'd never been and I just felt so struck by how amazing it is that we as humans can do that I think it's just like the beauty and the tragedy of being human that you you have this mind that can, you know, imagine things from 50 years ago or things that you've never even experienced. And I mean, I think that this is obviously deeply relevant to grief as well, that after somebody's died, they're still there. They still kind of live on in your mind and you can still picture yourself with them and talking to them. And I mean, I know everybody does. That's lovely. To... Yeah. And the, the, with the meditations, it was really interesting because like the, the Colors of Loss, the people were sitting together. Yeah. There was something very social and yeah. communal about these imaginary trips people took. And yeah. then depending on where they went, they were able to not just share that location, but also the memory, the life experience mm -hmm. that potentially led them to think of that beach. Yeah. So again, it was a lovely way of bringing people together, of allowing them to shape a narrative that was theirs but then to share whatever aspect they wanted to, whether it was the fictional aspect or the life experience that had triggered it. Yeah. It's very clever. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're getting to the end of our time, but it's been an incredibly rich conversation. I feel very privileged to be able to have been part of the team that were that made these two wonderful audio pieces. I would very much recommend that everyone go now and listen to them. They really are quite beautiful. And the only final thing left to do is just to thank our amazing panel for sharing their experiences, a little bit more about the making of these audio pieces and also their insights about storytelling and play as it relates to grief. So thank you, Harriet, Mark, and Amanda, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. And bye for now. <laughs>